Hi and welcome to Creating Cadence, a podcast for life and work in motion. I'm your host, Mish Bondizio, a writer, consultant, and the founder of Growth Sessions. The aim of my work is to help people develop better work-life cadence and more mindful approaches to work, to support their creativity, productivity and well-being, and manage their time, attention and stress better. So welcome to episode 18, the second episode in the third season of the Creating Cadence podcast. And as mentioned in the last episode, I'm experimenting with something different for this season. To recap, I invited six creative thinkers from my network, who work in a variety of different sectors and situations, to share their thoughts and experiences based on a set of specific questions relating to hybrid working, digital wellness, and productivity. My guests are Katerina King, Garth Dew, Amy Young, Ed Matthews Gentle, James Taplin, and Rashmir Balasubramaniam. In the last episode, episode 17, we looked at hybrid working, current trends driving the future of work, and the impact that this may all have on these people and their work. If you haven't listened to that one yet, I recommend doing so first as it'll give you a fuller introduction to my guests and it also sets the tone for the bigger picture surrounding this ongoing conversation over the next couple of episodes. So now in episode 18, we're exploring how the pandemic has created and influenced new ways of working for my guests and the personal lessons that they've learned about their well-being and productivity during this time. Please note, these conversations and responses have been recorded in real-world situations, so you may hear the sounds of traffic or roadworks, people chatting in the background, creaky chairs, rustling headphones, or random internet connectivity issues. If you're ready, let's dive in. So for this episode, I asked my panel two questions. Firstly, I wanted to know what changes they or their companies had made in the way that they're working during the pandemic, which they're now choosing to continue using or developing further as we go forward into this next part of life and work. Secondly, I was interested to find out what their biggest learnings have been from working during a pandemic in respect of their well-being, their focus and attention, and their productivity and performance. These two areas of inquiry may sound unrelated but you'll hear from my guests' responses just how inextricably linked they can be. First up, we have Katerina King, co-founder of Society One, which is a co-working space in Preston, Lancashire, which is where I'm based, and for my listeners in other parts of the world, that's in the northwest of England. Katerina introduces us to what turns out to be a central thread in our new way of working. I think lockdown has definitely changed the way people are working. I think the adoption of video calls has been a game changer for many people. I think it will become a more common occurrence and save a lot of unnecessary travel for meetings that can be held online. It also makes a lot of learning more accessible too. As Katerina continues, while being online has opened up new ways of living, working and connecting, there are downsides which can affect our well-being too. The last year has been like a roller coaster of emotions on so many levels. I've definitely learned that it is important to find time for myself and my family. Finding ways to escape and switch off my mind have been very high on my list, which hasn't been easy when we're surrounded by news and updates and changes all the time. But I think that space and downtime is super important. Next up, Garth Dew, a videographer, entrepreneur and the owner of GD Video, shares an excellent example of the benefits of incorporating video calls into the way we do business. So the biggest change was uh, client management and I think what I will continue to do is work via video call and using collaboration tools in the cloud to get pre-production done and post-production. Obviously, I'll still be going out to film with clients And as long as we do that within the rules and do it safely, there's no problem with that. And I see video work continuing to to be very popular. 
Um, but I think the pre and post production for me is where I can save time by not having to go out and meet people and we can do it remotely. And I'm definitely going to carry on with that. Garth also shares the opportunities that lockdown presented to build a stronger connection with his daughter and to change his work cycle to fit his well-being and support his relationships better. Living through COVID and lockdown has changed my mindset massively. I used to think that I needed to be working all the time, uh, filling my pipeline, selling, selling, doing, doing all the time. And I think what lockdown forced me to do initially was step back and realize that my daughter, who at the time was just turning three, is only young once. And I basically went into a, a month or two of almost full-time childcare when my production work was all cancelled. And I really enjoyed that. And we've got a much better relationship as a result. So I think it's made me assess work-life balance and I'm less interested now in being busy all the time and more interested in working on projects I want to do and having some balance in my life. So the way that's affected me during COVID is I might now work really hard for three or four weeks on a certain amount of projects and then I might feel like taking two or three weeks to relax a little bit more and spend a bit more time at home or doing other things. Personally, this style of working really resonates with me. As someone who works for themselves, I'm fortunate that I get to design and decide how most of my days can run. And I find that over the longer term, three to six week sprints of more intensive work, followed by a slower cycle for a week or two, works very well to create a supportive work-life cadence for me. During lockdown, I was fortunate to get the chance to really implement and cement that style of working. So that is now an embedded routine. But obviously everyone is different and you need to find a pattern and a cycle of work that works for you. Next is Amy Young, a senior account manager at ICG, a marketing agency based near Preston. Amy shares how video calls have become central to how they work and how they have enabled more inclusive meetings too. We admittedly didn't do lots of video calls before we went into lockdown. It was kind of, we, we did them, of course, and, and we had like, conference, you know, back in the day, conference calls and things. But I think the video calls al allows us to get in front of clients and show various members of the team as well, which, you know, before you're quite restricted in sometimes how many people go to a meeting and, you know, traveling and time out of the office and, that, and, and those kind of scenarios. So for us, continuing with video calls, although I know a lot of people have got video call fatigue, um, but continuing with video calls, you know, will still be key for us um, as an agency. Amy also mentioned that video calls also mean there are no geographical barriers whether that comes to hiring opportunities or to communicating with remote team members and clients. For communication, ICG have also become more reliant on digital tools such as Slack and WhatsApp for when more reactive internal communications are required. For those not working in the office, Amy confirms that the digital options have been an effective alternative in ICG's fast-paced work environment. But she also observed that while these tools can help to create connection, the experience is different from the sociability of gathering around someone's desk or popping over to see a colleague to chat through a problem in the real. On the productivity and well-being front, Amy's biggest lesson has been around setting boundaries and learning how and when to stop working so that work doesn't eat into the other parts of her life and affect her other responsibilities. I think it's knowing when to step away from, from work and understanding that Kind of not everything needs to be done in that moment. I, th I think that's the danger, obviously, of being when you're kind of at home, full, you know, fully full time working. Um, you might walk past your computer and think, oh, I'll just quickly reply to an email or I'll quickly do that. And it's kind of like, then it's not, it's always not just a quick reply, then something else crops up and things. So I think it is knowing when to kind of, you know, step away and, and understanding what what can be left until the next day or doesn't have to be done in that exact moment. Having to adjust her workflow to fit around her lifestyle and other responsibilities has made Amy more cognizant of respecting other people's situations too, as they may have needs which affect the pace at which they can work, so that they can still accommodate the other parts of their life too.
Next up is Ed Matthews Gentle, the program leader for a business support organization called Creative Lancashire. Creative Lancashire used to be based in an office at Lancashire County Council in Preston, which Ed commuted to regularly. But for the past year, Creative Lancashire's HQ has been a two meter by one and a half meter square space in the corner of Ed's dining room. So his commute has changed dramatically over this time, as has the idea of having a permanent HQ in this new low touch or no touch world. The physical constraints will make it unlikely that I'll ever sit with my colleagues again at County Hall in the way I did before. You know, it just won't happen. You know, the way that building used to function with thousands of people coming in and out the building every day, that just isn't going to be a thing in, in, in the future. Um, so tech is, is going to be part of the solution for that. But it, it won't be the only solution, but it's going to be um, a, a, a big part of it, really. Ed's sense of the intensifying fast pace of the world, with things always being on and paradigms shifting rapidly, has also encouraged him and his colleagues to slow things down and be more considered in their decision-making and action-taking. Because in his words, the constant making of plans and changing of plans also takes its toll. He also raises a good point about whether it's necessary to be geographically bound to a specific location if everything continues to be done online. And I kind of guess, you know, one of the lessons I've, I've learned or considered, you know, is that if I can work from home, you know, and be more productive from home in so many cases, but I can't do everything, but I can do a lot of stuff from home and I can do it fairly well. I mean, can home be anywhere? You know, where do I have to, do I have to be? You know, but I do naturally sort of feel that urge to have a connection with the organisations and individuals who I'm there to support and work with. So prior to lockdown, you know, I would frequently be at, at uh, co-working spaces like Society One as a way to sort of enhance the ability to have a connection, you know, and I still sort of need that. But, and I'm still sort of, um, you know, I, we're working a lot of this stuff out in terms of how it's going to be in the future. I mean, I'm going back to that thing about volumes of work, you know, and, and, and demands on time. Like Amy and Katerina, Ed also highlighted the need to switch off and the challenges that he experiences with trying to do so when the boundaries between work and home life are so blurred. We'll cover his response to that in a bit more detail in the next episode. This brings us to James Taplin, an ecologist and lead consultant for Innovate UK. James's first observation around productivity is about how the rhythm of our work has altered to the extent that there seems to be no space in the day, and how that's not necessarily a good thing. His thoughts are also a lament for the loss of novelty, unexpectedness and serendipity, all things which influence and support creative thought. But his point is also a warning about the dangers of polarisation. There's something terrible now about the constant purpose of every single minute of the day. Like if you're planning something in, if, if you're not travelling anywhere, you've got no gaps in between anything, you've got no downtime, you're not seeing anything unexpected, you're not meeting people randomly on the streets, you're not buying a coffee and having overhearing conversation in a coffee shop, whatever else it might be, everything is purposeful like my calendar is built in from nine o'clock to six o'clock or whatever else it is there's chunk 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 chunk. i know exactly what i'm doing all the time there's no space for any kind of novelty and and unexpectedness and and there is a real problem actually in this in that and i think it encourages all to be a lot more polarized and we've always been a bit polarized we've always been stuck a little bit in our own filter bubbles online and that used to be counted a little bit by the fact we'd go out and we'd see real people in the street and maybe that would change some of our opinions. But now, you know, if, you're, if all you're doing is working with the same people all the time and thinking the same thoughts all the time, that, that filter bubble becomes ever more intense and the polarisation between people potentially becomes ever more intense as well. James also mentioned how removing our commute from our workday has had some unrecognised impacts and may continue to do so for people who continue to work from home if they can't find ways to build that space back into their day. I think there's also something that has changed 
and I'm sure you've seen this as well, people have been talking about travel itself as, a, as an integral part of actually an, an unrecognized but integral part of the success of a day. So people generally would, I mean, the, the classic example is the commute and people have always bemoaned the commute and I'm sure there's lots that's terrible about the commute. But I think, actually for me, my commute was a 10 mile ride to a station, which was lovely. You know, that was quite a nice commute. Um, but I think even for those people who used to bemoan the community, what, what, what that travel used to do was give people a bit of a kind of a mindful space to get themselves sorted for the day, to work out where they're going, just to kind of get their heads settled. It was a signifier that the day was starting. You know, there was a transition from the home to the working. And that's a problem, I think, with that kind of the, the, the home working and the distributed working is, you know, what, what are those barriers? What are those cues that tell you you're starting or stopping? Or And there's also something about the mindfulness of just doing something like driving or like cycling that allows your brain just to kind of tick away on other problems, you know, not without even really realising it and sort of gets things settled in your head. Other more personal learnings that James has gained over this time have to do with connecting with his family more deeply and incorporating more intentional creative activities into his day-to-day to help set the tone for his days and for his focus. For James, his specific creative activity was forging knives, waking early in the morning to develop a skill that he intends to continue mastering as we come out of lockdown. Now let's hear from Rashmir Balasubramaniam, an independent leadership coach and advisor to women. Like James, Rashmir has become even more intentional about how she works as a result of her experiences this past year. And here's her response to my question about whether she'd made any specific changes to how she's working. So the answer to this one for me is yes and no. Because I was already working remotely and from home, there's many things that haven't really changed. What has changed, though, I think is the intensity of the time spent on Zoom and And so I, I, you know, the first couple of months of lockdown, I was quite cognizant of the impact on, you know, my eyes of looking at a screen for so many hours in the day. And so it made me, it made me, I suppose, a little more disciplined about trying to get out into nature and get away from my screen. You know, even if it was just a little bit at the very beginning of the day, this is harder in winter, of course, than in summer. But um, it it just brought a, an increased emphasis to finding and maintaining balance because I've worked very hard over many years to to move away from being a, something of a workaholic to having a more balanced lifestyle. And it's very easy when there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of need to kind of fall back into that. Like many others, this time has enabled Rashmir to reflect a lot more on what's truly important. She notes how the search for meaning globally encompasses more than just our lifestyle or work style. I'd say many people are also thinking more, not just about environment, environmental impact, but also about social impact. And so that ensuring that there is ongoing time for reflection around what is important and what is purposeful seems to be something that is very important to people and to myself. And actually for me, given my tendency to fall into um, workaholic kind of modes and and practices, just emphasizing having fun and building time into my life to, you know, get out into nature, to try new things, to to just do things where where I have fun and where I laugh has, has been something that I've realized is incredibly important. And of course, I think for a lot of people too, just the awareness of, of recognizing and investing in building strong relationships and more diverse relationships is, is another thing. So the questions I asked my panel for this episode revolved around what they'd learned about their well-being and productivity during this past year and what they'll be doing more of in their future of work. The central crux appears to be that as we continue to spend more time connecting and working online, We've also identified that we really need to embed practices that support and protect our creativity and our well-being, because without these, we're less productive. We can benefit from slowing things down, creating more opportunities for pause, 
and being more intentional in how we live and work. We can benefit from creating stronger boundaries between work life and the rest of our life, even if those boundaries can't be physical because our office happens to be at our dining room table. We can benefit from incorporating activities that can substitute for what we get out of a commute or being in a real-world office. We can benefit from building fun, joy, laughter and play into our day. The key is intentionality and having a real desire to live and work in a better way, rather than being dragged along on autopilot. It does require some thought and it does take practice, but that's how developing any new habit or ritual starts. And that's what we've been doing for the last year really, is experimenting. So why not continue, try, experiment, give it a go at making some change to support yourself better, and keep coming back to what's important. Here's a hint. What's important is usually not the deadline or the client project. We have one life. If we choose to look after our bodies and our minds first, they'll be more resilient to the challenges that we're likely to face ahead. And they'll enable us to continue to create and deliver well in our work and support others in our relationships and communities. If we don't put our well-being first, we're likely to crash and burn in this new future of work. And that's the stark reality. In the next episode of this third season, my panel will be commenting on what they find most challenging about online working. They'll also share their personal tips for protecting their attention, maintaining their focus and supporting their well-being and productivity. If you have thoughts about this episode or you have a question relating to well-being, hybrid working or productivity, then I'd love to hear from you. You can write to hello at growthsessions.co. Thanks for listening. If you're liking the Creating Cadence podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you could please rate it or leave a review via Apple Podcasts, or you could email me a testimonial. This all helps other people like you to find the podcast. Until next time, please take care out there. Be brave, think big, and keep moving forwards, one step at a time. Bye for now.